In this lecture, we shall discuss the nature, scope, and sources of constitutional law. The nature, scope, and sources of constitutional law. So the first question that we shall begin with is to identify and explain what constitutional law is. So the first question is, what is constitutional law? Now, the first thing to note is that there is no unanimity among the scholars as far as the definition of what constitutional law is. Different scholars have ascribed different and various definitions as to the term constitutional law. So what we will do is that we will go over the different and authoritative definitions that have been given to constitutional law by the various authors. We shall start with the definition of constitutional law by A.V. Dyson in his book, Introduction to the Study of the Law of the Constitution. In A.V. Dyson's book, Introduction to the Study of the Law of the Constitution, he defines constitutional law as the rules affecting the structure and power of government, which are enforceable in courts of law. He defines constitutional law as the rules regulating and affecting the structure and power of government, which are enforceable in the courts of law. A.V. Dicey defines a constitution, constitutional law as the rules affecting the structure and powers of government which are enforceable in the court of law. Another authoritative definition of constitutional law is the one given by Munro in his literary work, What is the Constitution? Public Law. He defines constitutional law as the rules and arrangements relating to the government of a country. Monroe defines constitutional law as the rules and arrangements relating to the government of the country. And then there's also Brian Thompson. Brian Thompson in his literary work, Constitutional and Administrative Law. He defines constitutional law as the law relating to the system of government of a country. The law relating to the system of government of a country. And then, very importantly, is the definition given by the authors of Jando and Griffith, a source book of the constitutional law of Ghana. The authors of GNG, what we know as GNG, is Jando and Griffith, a source book of the constitutional law of Ghana. They define constitutional law as the constitutional law of a country. And they define constitutional law of Ghana as follows. And I'm quoting that the constitutional law of Ghana, the constitutional law of a country, is not simply the law of a constitutional document or document produced by or for that country. Properly understood, the study of constitutional law of a country should encompass an inquiry into the entire process of the creation and adaptation by whatever means of institutions and practices for the governance of the country. I'll take that again. The authors of Jandor and Griffiths, a source book of the constitutional law of Ghana, define constitutional law as follows, and I'm quoting. The constitutional law of a country is not simply the law of a constitutional document or documents produced by or for that country. Properly understood, the, the study of constitutional law of a country should encompass an inquiry into the entire process of the creation and adaptation by whatever means of institutions and practice for the governance of a country. Quote end. So we have gone through the definitions of constitutional law given by Brown Thompson. We have looked at the definition of constitutional law by A.B. Dicey. And we have looked at the definition of constitutional law by Mundo. And you realize that 
for all of them, they are all talking about the rules affecting the structure and power of government and are also enforceable in the court of law. But then in addition to all these definitions, it must be noted that the constitutional law of a country must necessarily also include the judicial decisions of the relevant court of law in a country on issues of governance. When you read the learned Professor Kumado's book titled A Handbook of the Constitutional Law of Ghana and His History, Sir Kofi Kumado indicates that in addition to all the definitions given by A.V. Dicey and the others, it must be recognized that the constitutional law of a country, it also embraces the principles of law that are embodied in the judgments of the relevant courts of law of a country over time on issues of government. It is important to note the use of the expression judgments of the relevant courts of law of a country over time on issues of governance. It means that it's not just the government of any court at all that will form part of the constitutional law of a country. It must be of the relevant courts. So in Ghana, for example, that means of the district courts, of the circuit courts, they may not form part of the decisions that can form a part of the constitutional law of Ghana. This is because under Article 130 and Article 2 of the Constitution, it is the Supreme Court that has exclusive jurisdiction to deal with all matters relating to the interpretation and enforcement of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana. And therefore, we are careful in noting that as far as the definition of constitutional law is concerned, we are not just referring to the decisions or judicial decisions of any courts. We are referring to the judgments of the relevant court of law of the country on issues of government. Now, it must be pointed out that in all of these definitions of constitutional law by Brown Thompson, by A.B. Dicey, by Muru, at the very bottom of it is that they are all making reference to the word a constitution. And therefore, we must proceed to define what a constitution is in order to gain a deeper picture about what constitutional law is. And so for the definition of a constitution, I must mention that there is a broad definition of a constitution and there's a narrow definition of a constitution. So the narrow definition of a constitution is the one that defines a constitution as a document or a series of documents in which you can have the rules or laws of the country embedded in. So the narrow definition of a constitution places emphasis on a document or a series of documents in which the rules or the laws of the country are embodied. So for example, if, we, if you look at the definition of a constitution in the narrow sense as a document, you can think of countries like Ghana, where we have the 1992 Constitution of Ghana. Or if you talk about countries where you have a series of documents, 1957 Constitution of Ghana, the Ghana's best constitution of the Gold Coast, they were contained in a series of documents. So the now definition of a constitution, once again, it defines a constitution as a document or a series of documents in which the rules or laws of the country are embodied. Another person like Sir Albogenes, his definition of a constitution aligns more with a narrow definition of a constitution because Sir Albogenes defines a constitution as the document in which are set out the rules governing the composition, powers, 
and methods of operation of the main institutions of government and the general principles defining the relationship between the states and the citizens. So, under Sir Ibojanin's definition as well, we see him defining a constitution as a document in which are set out the rules governing the composition, powers, and methods of operation of the main institutions of government, government and the general principles defining the relationship between the states and the citizens. That is the narrow definition of a constitution. But for the broad definition of a constitution, it is referring to the entirety of the body of rules. It is referring to the entirety of all the principles, all the practices, all the norms that operate in a particular legal system. That is what the broad definition of the constitution seeks to look at. So, if you look critically at the definitions and you pay critically attention at the two definitions, the broad definition talking about the entirety of the rules, the principles, the practices, and the attitudes that relate to the creation and implementation of the system of government. If you read Sir Kofi Komado's book, he defines constitution in a broad sense as the body of rules, principles, practices, and attitudes relating to the creating and implementation of the system of government. That is the structure and functions and powers of the organs or centers of power for the management of the public affairs of a state or entity or organization. Example, the African Union, their relationship with other, each and other citizenry and among the citizens or members. So if you look at the board definition, it's looking at the entirety of rules, the principles. It is not placing any emphasis on the documents that contain the rules that apply in the legal system. Now, if you pay a close attention to these two definitions, the broad and the narrow definition of the constitution, you realize that the broad definition reflects the actual nature of the constitution. Because think about it, today, if we talk about the constitution of Ghana, it can never only refer to just the, doc the rules and laws that we see in a single document or book. It refers to the entirety because when the issues come up before the course, they take into account the people's history, they take into account our development, and they read meaning into what you have in the black and white letter of the constitution. And in Tufuan Attorney General, as we will soon see, we are told that a constitution like ours is supposed to be construed as a living organism capable of growth and development. So, as a matter of fact, interpretation of the constitution of Ghana cannot be restricted to just the text. We will, see, we will soon see in a number of cases that the courts take into account the spirits of the constitution. And so the broad definition of the constitution reflects the actual nature of the constitution. But the narrow definition reflects the form, the form, the form in which the rules of the constitution have been captured. So in Ghana, for example, the narrow definition will fall in line with the form in which our fundamental law has been captured. That is the 1992 constitution, the document that you have. But the broad definition will take into account the actual nature of the constitution, that we don't restrict it to just what you have in black and white that it includes every other thing, including the judicial decisions and how they read meanings, they decipher the spirit of the constitution. Now, as we have already noticed, it was in our explanation of constitutional law that we led us to define what a constitution is. So we have defined constitutional law, we've also defined the constitution in the broad and the narrow sense. It is important to mention that as far as constitutional law is concerned, we, are, we will study constitutional law that it embraces all these two definitions of the constitution. So, so far we have explained constitutional law, we have also defined what the constitution is. We know the broad and the narrow definition of the constitution. The next thing is to move on to the characteristics of a constitution. 
What are the essential characteristics of a constitution? The first thing that we need to notice is that a constitution is a product of constituent power. When we say it is a product of constituent power, what we mean is that the constitution is something that emanates from the people. And if you read Chief Justice Marshall, the victim in the case of Marbury and Madison, this is what he says. He says that a constitution, he describes a constitution as the original right of a people. The original right of a people to establish for future government such principles as in their opinion shall most conduce to their own happiness. So when we say it is a characteristic of a constitution that is the product of constituent power, it means that for every constitution, you must be able to point out the very people who have given their mandate. The very people in whom the sovereignty resides, you will have to see them that it is their constituent power that has led to the passage of the constitution. That's one characteristic. Another characteristic is that the constitution is the fundamental law of the land, and it therefore sets the ultimate set of principles. It gives all the principles, and it is the very law from which all other laws in the legal system, they emanate from, and they derive their validity and legitimacy from. Again, another characteristic of a constitution is that it has special sanctity as the supreme law of the land. Again, a constitution also will contain ideas, aspirations, and values of the society that is concerned. And so if you look at the 1992 Constitution of Ghana, for example, if you look at chapter six of our constitution, it gives you the ideas, the aspirations, and values of the people of Ghana. You see over there, the Ghana is a democratic state and that's the five committed to the ideals of democracy. It is showing you the ideal ideas and aspirations of the people of Ghana. Again, a constitution must also contain some information on how government is structured. A constitution must also contain information about the rights and responsibilities of individuals. And then a constitution must also contain rules that would emphasize and show how it is supposed to be amended. So we have seen a number of characteristics. One, we mentioned that it is a characteristic that a constitution is a, it's a product of constituent power. We've also mentioned that, number two, it is a fundamental law and it's the law from which all other laws derive their validity from. We've also mentioned as our third point, that the constitution has a special sanctity in the sense that it's the supreme law of the land. We've also mentioned as our fourth point that a constitution contains ideas and aspirations and values of the society concerned. We've also mentioned as a fifth point that the constitution also contains information about the structure of government. As a sixth point, we mentioned that the constitution also contains information on the rights and responsibilities of individuals. As an eighth point, we mentioned that the constitution will also have provisions for its amendments. Now, number nine, the constitution of a country would also include practices, attitudes, conventions. When we say conventions, we are referring to those rules which are understood and implemented over the years. They may not be legal rules per se, but they may have enjoyed widespread approval of the people. Now, you see, it is important at this point to draw a distinction between what you mean by conventions and then the law of the constitution. Because conventions, if you read A. V. Dicey's book, I mean, A.V. Dyson mentions that conventions that are developed under the constitution, even though they may even enjoy widespread approval, they are not enforceable in the court of law. Even though conventions may enjoy widespread authority, they are not enforceable in the court of law. 
But even though we are mentioning that they are not enforceable in the court of law, the courts have a right, and the court can take notice of such conventions in reaching a decision. So a constitution, you also have conventions. And like you have said, the conventions, according to every dicey, even though they may enjoy widespread approval, they are not enforceable in the courts of law. So we have about nine characteristics of a constitution. The next thing that we have to move on to is to now explain what we mean by hard and soft laws. If you realize when we're defining, when we're mentioning our discussions on conventions and the law of the constitution, we mentioned that conventions, even though they may enjoy widespread approval, they may not be enforceable in the court of law. It is things like conventions that people approve but are not enforceable in the court of law that we may refer to as soft laws. But the rules which are legal and are enforceable in the court of law, we refer to as hard laws. Hard laws. Now let us conduct a critique of the definitions of a constitution. Remember that with a narrow definition, emphasis is placed on a document or series of documents. Now, if you say a written a constitution is in a document, that may not really be the situation in contemporary times. Because no matter how much a country's constitution will be written, it can never be possible that all the essential rules of governance will be comprehensively spelled out in that particular document. I mean, even the one of the oldest written constitutions in the world, the United States Constitution, it only has only broad guidelines. It doesn't have all the rules that are based in the legal system. So there are times when you meet people and they say that whatever is happening, let's go and check and see whether it's in the Constitution. It can never be true. It can never be true that everything at all that will happen in the human society, provision would have been made for it in the Constitution. And therefore, that whole classification that there's a written constitution and there's one that is unwritten, it appears to be a classification which may not be entirely applicable because no matter how much a written account, a constitution is written, there will definitely be unwritten aspects of that constitution. There will definitely be an unwritten aspect of that constitution. The next point is to now move on to discuss the classification. The classification and focus of constitutions, the classification and focus of constitutions. Now, before I even move ahead, I must mention that even though we may discuss about eight classifications, it is possible that a constitution may fall within more than one classification. Right. So the first classification we are looking at is the flexible or rigid constitution. Now, when we talk about rigid or flexible, we are classifying the constitution based on the rules that have been provided for, for the amendment of the constitution. If the constitution is one that has special rules for its amendment, then it is a rigid constitution. But if it's a constitution that has very flexible provisions for its amendment, then we call it a flexible constitution. So for rigid constitutions, like that of the 1992 Republic, Republican Constitution of Ghana, in fact, you must go through a referendum involving the whole body politic of Ghana before it can be amended. If you have to go through a referendum, it means that you have a special procedure for an amendment. It makes it a rigid constitution. But if, let's say, you can just amend the constitution like you amend any law in the legal system, then it becomes a flexible constitution. So the first classification we've seen is the rigid or flexible constitution. The next one is monarchical or republican constitution. The monarchical or republican constitution is a classification which is based on how the head of state gets into office. If it's a constitution whereby the head of state gets into office through inheritance, 
because his father was the head of state. When the father dies, he too becomes the head of state. If it's a constitution where the person becomes a head of state by inheritance, then it's a monarchical constitution. But if the head of state gets into office through elections, that is, he gets into office not through inheritance, you have to go and campaign and win elections, then it becomes a republican constitution. So in Ghana, for example, our constitution, you must campaign and win elections before you win. In that instance, what we have in Ghana is a republican constitution. And then we have the presidential or parliamentary constitution. The focus on this classification is on the relationship between the legislature and the executive. If the executive is one that is answerable and controlled by the legislature, then the constitution is what we call the parliamentary constitution. So for example, in the UK, you can have a situation whereby, you can have a situation whereby Parliament can pass a vote of no confidence in the executive. And when Parliament passes a vote of no confidence, it means that the entire executives are leaving office. It means that the executive is being controlled by the legislature. And we call that one a parliamentary constitution. In many of those instances under the parliamentary constitutions, all parliamentarians, all ministers are taken from parliament. That is when we have the parliamentary constitution. But if you have a case whereby the president takes all his ministers not from parliament, so the executive is separate and independent from parliament. In that instance, we call it a presidential system. And over here, it might be mentioned that you have a president and executive, and his ministers are not from parliament. So parliament does not control the executive. We call that one the presidential system. So in a parliamentary system, we have our ministers from Parliament, as we had under the 1969 Constitution of Ghana. The Prime Minister of Ghana was a member of Parliament, but the President was not a member of Parliament. So we had a parliamentary system, something like that, under the 1969 Constitution of Ghana. But under the current 1992 Constitution, the President rather appoints majority of his ministers from parliament. So political and legal commentators have described the 1992 constitution as a hybrid constitution, as a hybrid constitution. And then we'll move on to the unitary and federal constitution. Now for this classification, it is based on the centralization or the evolution of constitutional powers. It is based on the centralization or the evolution of constitutional powers. So if you have a country where all the powers of the state are vested in the central or national government, then we say it is a unitary constitution. So in Ghana, for example, all the powers of the state are vested in the central or national government. It's a unitary constitution. But when you have a situation whereby the powers of the state are distributed between a national or a central government and then two or more authorities on a regional or on a provincial basis. And in those instances, those regional or provincial entities, they are semi-autonomous and then they have powers on their own. And so the powers are shared between the central government and then those semi-autonomous bodies. Then we have a federal constitution. So in federal constitution, you have a distribution of governmental powers 
and the distribution is shared between the national or the central government and then two or more authorities. But the sharing is done on a regional or on a provincial basis. And all those regional or provincial entities, they have their own semi-autonomy as far as the administration of the country is concerned. So in Nigeria, for example, you realize we have the federal government and we have the governors. The governors. In America, so you have the central government with the president, and then you have the governors of the respective states. So there is a sharing of power. But in Ghana, we only have a president. We have a central government in Ghana. Then we have a single or multi-party classification. This classification focuses on the place and how we have how the constitution guarantees freedom of association. If you have a constitution which says that there can be only one political party and the country is a one-party state, so you have a one-party state. But if it's a country, if it's a constitution that allows multiple parties to contest for elections, then you have a multi-party constitution. So in Ghana, when we had our first constitution in 1960. In 1964, there was an amendment to the 1960 constitution. And that amendment had the effect of making the Convention People's Party the only legal party in Ghana. So from 1964, we only had one legal party in Ghana. All other parties, if you agree to be legal, that is a classical case of a one-party constitution. But if we have a constitution that allows many parties to operate, like we have under the 1992 constitution, we have NDC, MPP, CPP, PM, PMP, PPP, we have many political parties, then it becomes a multi-party constitution. Then we have the diarchical constitution. Diarchical constitution. For the diarchical constitutions, it is a classification that is based on dividing governmental competence between two or more authorities, otherwise than on the regional basis. So the division in this case is not based on the, it's not, it's not on the regional basis. And the classical example would be, for example, when you have lawmaking power. The lawmaking power has been divided between the executive and the legislature. So the executive has provisions in the constitution that has given it power to make laws. And then the legislature too has provisions in the constitution giving it power to also what? Make laws. So you can see that as far as the legislative power is concerned, it has been divided into two or more authorities. So if we have legislative, if you have a constitution where governmental competence has been divided and given to two or more authorities, this one is not on the regional basis. It's a, and I'm giving a classical case where you have legislative power. And this power has been divided and shared to the executive and then the legislature. So the executive can draw from the constitution and make laws. Par Parliament can also draw from the constitution and also make laws. We have a diarchical constitution. And for examples of this, you can look at the French Republican Constitution of 1958. Then you also have a classification based on written and unwritten constitutions. I will not spend much time on this because we already mentioned that the written constitutions are ones that people define as a single document or a series of documents in which the fundamental laws of the country are embodied in. And for the written constitutions, the people who define the written constitution, I mean, in the narrow sense, who say that it is the one that is written and has the fundamental laws of the states. But the unwritten constitution classification is one that focuses on the entire laws, the norms, the values that are in a particular legal system. Then we also have another classification, unicameral and bicameral constitution. If you have a constitution which is unicameral, it means that it provides for only one legislature. So there's only one chamber as far as the legislature is concerned. In Ghana, when you talk about parliament, we have only one chamber of parliament. But where the constitution provides for two chambers, so that you have 
maybe a lower timber, an upper timber, then you have a bicameral legislature. So we look at ACE classifications. One, we look at the rigid flexible. Two, we look at the monarchical republican. Three, we look at the presidential parliamentary. Four, we look at unitary federal. Five, we look at simple, single or multi-party classification. Six, we look at diarchical constitution. Seven, we look at the written and unwritten constitutions. Eight, unicameral and bicameral constitution. The next thing is to now identify what are the sources of constitutional law. Now we've already defined what constitutional law is. We've already defined what a constitution is. We've also looked at the different classifications of a constitution. Our next question is, what are the sources of constitutional law? One, one we'll look at organic law legislation. When we talk about organic law or legislation, I'm referring to legislations which organize the institutions. Legislations which regulate the exercise of public powers through the organs of government. So if you look at something like the Court Act, the Court Act is a legislation which is organizing a particular institution, which is the judiciary. It is showing how the judiciary is going to exercise its power. It's a sort of constitutional law. So organic law legislation, we are referring to legislations, which will organize institutions. They are going to regulate the exercise of public rights through the organs of government, which the constitution has established. So the court acts 1993 as 459. It is showing us how the judiciary as an organ of government is going to exercise its power and is going to be regulated. Local government acts is also another organic legislation. So if you look at the local governance act of 2016, acts 936, it is showing us how local government is supposed to be regulated in Ghana. And local government is established and recognized under the 1992 Constitution, organic law legislation. By referring to legislations which organize institutions, they regulate the exercise of public powers through the organs of government, which the Constitution has established. Electoral Commission of Ghana Act. Electoral Commission of Ghana Act 1993 and 451 is also showing us how an, a, a particular organ created by the constitution is supposed to be regulated. So organic law legislation, organic law, these are things, they are invented legislations that organize institutions and they regulate the exercise of public powers through the organs of government which the constitution has established. And I believe by now you know that something like Income Tax Act will not be an organic law legislation because it's not showing us how any particular organ is going to be. They are not showing how you are coming to take the tax from you. So that is one sort of constitutional law. Income Tax Act is showing how you are just going to tax and collect the revenue. It's not showing how a particular organ is being regulated. You have judicial decisions. They also form a source of constitutional law. And we'll look at this in detail and see how very notable cases like foreign attorney general, J. Edmondson attorney general, MPP and attorney general, 33 December case, MPP and attorney general, CBA case, AGL, AGA Truman attorney general. We'll see how these cases have shaped the constitutional law of Ghana. So judicial decisions form part of the sources of constitutional law. Customary law also forms a source of our constitutional law. And if you look at the learning of our constitution, you will see that customary law is recognized as one of the sources of laws of Ghana. That's good. So that's three. Customary law is recognized as one of the sources of our laws of Ghana. We also have the common law also being part of the sources of law or constitutional law. We also have textbooks 
but not just any form of textbook, but the textbook from recognized scholars like Avery Dicey, recognized scholars like John Boy and Griffiths. We have Sir Kofi Komando's book on constitutional law. These are recognized and authoritative scholars of constitutional law. Their books can form a sort of constitutional law. Benyon, they form sources of constitutional law. So you look at organic law number one, judicial legislations. You look at organic law legislation number one, judicial decisions number two, customary law number three, common law number four, textbooks number five. You look at these as sources of constitutional law. Now, the main thing that we have to note and what to wrap up with in this discussion is that you realize that we have looked at the narrow definition of the constitution and the broad definition. We must see how the case law has reflected and played out these definitions of the constitution. Permit me at this point to refresh your memory in terms of the narrow definition and the broad definition of the constitution. The broad definition is one that takes into account all the norms, the laws, the values, and everything that operates in the legal system, the broad definition. But the narrow one is what focuses on the documents. And remember, I mentioned that the broad definition reflects the true nature of the constitution. Now, let us see how the case law has reflected the broad definition of the constitution. And we'll begin with the case of Tufo and Attorney General, reported in the 1980 Ghana Law Report at page 367. Specifically, I shall quote the dictum of Suwa JSC at page 636 to page 637 of the judgment of the law reports. And I'm quoting. A written constitution such as ours is not an ordinary act of parliament. It embodies the will of the people. It also mirrors their history. Account therefore needs to be taken of it as a landmark in the people's set for progress. It contains within it their aspirations and their hopes for a better and a fuller life. The constitution has its letter of the law. Equally, the constitution has its spirits. It is the fountainhead for the authority which each of the three arms of government possesses and exercises. It is a source of strength. It is a source of power. The executive, the legislature, and the judiciary are created by the constitution. Their authority is derived from the constitution. Their sustenance is derived from the constitution. Its methods of alteration are specified. In our peculiar circumstances, these methods require the involvement of the whole body politic of Ghana. Its language, therefore, must be considered as if it were a living organism capable of growth and development. Indeed, it is a living organism capable of growth and development. As the whole body politic of Ghana itself is capable of growth and development. A broad and liberal spirit is required for its interpretation. It does not admit of a narrow interpretation. A doctrinaire approach to interpretation would not do. We must take of it, we must take account of its principles and bring that consideration to bear in bringing it into conformity to the needs of time. And so we must take cognizance of the age-old fundamental principle of constitutional construction, which gives effect to the intent of the framers of this organic law. 
every word has an effect. Every part must be given effect. Perhaps it would not be out of place to remember the injunction of St. Paul contained in his first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 14 to 20, King James Version. And the man that says, so I went I to quote from the Bible as follows. And I'm quoting. For the body is not one member. If the foot say, if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not the body, it is therefore not of the body. And if the ear say, if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, it is therefore not of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? The whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now are they many members, yet but one body, and the quote ends. The learned Jesus, so what GSC went ahead to deliver himself as follows. And so a construction should be avoided which leads to absurdity. And when a particular interpretation leads to two, shall we say inconsistent results, the spirit of the constitution will demand that the more reasonable of the two should be adhered to. We must have recourse to the constitution as a whole. Put ends. So you will see that Chief Justice Sowa, you will see that, sorry, Sowa JSC was recognizing that the written constitution like ours is not an ordinary act of parliament and that it rather embodies the role of the people. It mirrors their history. It means that when you are construing the constitution, you don't only restrict yourself to the letter, but you must also take into account the spirit. This aligns more to the broad definition of the constitution. Because as you remember, in our broad definition of the constitution, we said that we are not supposed to restrict ourselves to just the letter. Permit me at this point to read and rehash how the authors of Jambo and Griffiths in the source book of the Constitutional Law of Ghana define constitutional law. They define it as not simply the law of the constitutional document or documents produced for that country. Properly understood, the study of the constitutional law of a country should encompass an inquiry into the entire process of the creation and adaptation by whatever means of institutions and practices for the governance of the country. So if you see so what JSC defining a constitution to take into account the will of the people, mirroring their history, then it should lean more, if you see that he's leaning more towards the broad definition of the constitution. That is to four and attorney general. Let's move on to another case, Marbury and Madison. And this is what Chief Justice Marshall had to say. And I'm quoting. The, phrase, the particular physiology of the Constitution of the United States confirms the strengths, confirms and strengthens the principle supposed to be essential to all written constitutions, that a law repugnant to the Constitution is void, and that courts as well as other departments are bound by that instrument. And it goes ahead. The authority, therefore, given to the Supreme Court by the act establishing the Judicial Court of the United States to issue writs of mandamus to public officers appears not to be warranted by the Constitution. And it becomes necessary to inquire whether a jurisdiction so conferred can be exercised. The question whether an act repugnant to the constitution can become the law of the land is a question deeply interesting to the United States, but happily not of any 
lot of an intricacy proportion to its interests. It seems only necessary to recognize certain principles supposed to have been long and well established to decide this. That the people have an original right to establish for their future government, such principle as in their opinion must conduce to their own happiness is the basis on which the whole American fabric has been erected. The exercise of this original right is a very great exertion. Nor can it, nor ought it to be frequently repeal, repeated. The principles, therefore so established, are deemed fundamental. And as the authority from which they proceed is supreme and can seldom act, they are designed to be permanent. The original and supreme will recognizes, organizes the government and assigns to different departments their respective powers. It may either stop here or establish certain limits not to be transcended by those departments. The government of the United States is of the latter description. The powers of the legislature are defined and limited, and that those limits may not be mistaken or forgotten. The Constitution is written. I take that part again. The powers of the legislature are defined and limited, and that those limits may not be mistaken or forgotten, the Constitution is written. To what purpose? Are powers limited? And to what purpose is that limitation committed to writing? If these limits be at any time be passed by those intended to be restrained. The distinction between a government with limited or unlimited powers is abolished. If those limits do not confine the persons on whom they are imposed, and if acts prohibited and acts allowed are of equal obligation. It is a proposition too plain to be contested that the Constitution controls any legislative act repugnant to it, or that the legislature may alter the Constitution by an ordinary act. Between these alternatives, there's no middle ground. The Constitution is either a superior, paramount law, unchangeable by ordinary means, or it is on a level with ordinary legislative acts, and like other acts, is alterable when the legislature shall please to alter it. If the former part of the alternative be true, then a legislative act contrary to the constitution is not law. If the latter part be true, then written constitutions are absurd attempts on the part of the people to limit a power in its own nature, illimitable. Certainly, all those who have framed written constitutions contemplate them as forming the fundamental empowerment law of the nation. And consequently, the theory of every such government must be that an act of the legislature repugnant to the constitution is void. This theory is essentially attached to a written constitution and is consequently to be considered by this court as one of the fundamental principles of our society. It is therefore not to be lost sight of in the further consideration of the subject. If an act of the legislature repugnant to the constitution is void, does it notwithstanding its invalidity, bind the courts and oblige them to give its effects. Or in other words, though it not be law, does it constitute a rule as operative as if it was a law? This would be to overthrow in fact what was established in theory and would seem at first view an absurdity too gross to be insisted on. It shall however, receive a more attentive consideration. 
It is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Those who apply the rule to particular cases must of necessity expound and interpret that rule. If two laws conflict with each other, the courts must decide on the operation of each. So if a law be in opposition to the constitution, if both the law and the constitution apply to a particular case, so that the court must either decide that case conformably to the law, disregarding the constitution, or conformably to the constitution, disregarding the law, the court must determine which of these conflicting rules govern the case. This is of the very essence of judicial duty. If then the courts are to regard the constitution, and the constitution is superior to any ordinary act of the legislature, the constitution, and not any such ordinary act, has governed the case to which they both apply. Those who then, those then who controvert the principle that the constitution is to be considered in courts as a paramount law are reduced to the necessity of maintaining that courts must close their eyes on the constitution and see only the law. This doctrine would subvert the very foundation of all written constitution and the quote ends. This quote is from Marbury and Madison and the quote is from Chief Justice Marshall. And he was essentially talking about the US constitution and embedding in it, you see that leans also in favor of the broad definition of a constitution. Let's move on to the next case, which is the Ghanaian case of Ajay Chum and Attorney General in Akuti, 2005 2006, Supreme Court of Ghana law report at page 372. And you will love this case. Ajay Chum, first Attorney General in Akuti, 205 206. Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report, page 732, to put the holding that I'm about to read in a better perspective. Let me just give a background to the case. Under Article 146, Clause 3 of the 1992 Constitution, it reads as follows. If the president receives a petition for the removal of justice of a superior court other than the chief justice or for the removal of a chairman of a regional tribunal, he shall refer the petition to the chief justice who shall determine whether there's a prima facie case. Put ends. Essentially, what 146 plus 3 is saying is that if the president receives a petition and is for a removal of any superior court justice, which is not the chief justice, then the president must refer the petition to the CJ, who must first determine whether there is a prima facie case. Means that when the CJ, when the CJ determines that there's a prima facie case, that is when we will now spend more time to go into it. But if there's no final facial case, very frivolous, bogus petition, then there's no need to go and form a committee. Use taxpayers' money to pay them to now come and inquire into your petition. So the CJ is there to see out very frivolous petitions. Now, remember that one for the six plus three says that this requirement of a prima facie case is for when there's a petition for the removal of a justice of a superior court other than the chief justice. What if the petition is for the removal of the chief justice? One for the six plus six says as follows. And I quote, where the petition is for the removal of the chief justice, the president shall, acting in consultation with the council of states, appoint a committee consisting of two justices of the Supreme Court, one of whom shall be appointed chairman of the by the president and three other persons who are not members of the Council of States 
nor members of parliament, nor lawyers. Then clause seven, the committee appointed under clause six of this article shall inquire into the petition and recommend to the president whether the chief justice ought to be removed from office. And the quote ends. What can we say about 146 plus three that I read first and 146 plus six and plus seven? The clause three makes it a requirement that there must be a prima facie case when you want to remove justices of the superior court apart from the chief justice. But, and I'll explain that one, that that one is supposed to save out very frivolous petitions. But when the petition is for the removal of the chief justice himself, the letter of ground for the sixth law six doesn't make it any requirement that there must be a prima facie case. It only says that form the committee and the committees are inquiring to the petition and determine a requirement to the president whether the CJ ought to be removed or not. This is the letter of the law. And let me read the one for the sixth clause three again. That if the president receives a petition for the removal of a justice of the superior court, other than the chief justice. So the framers know what they were saying, and they said that other than the chief justice. Now, with this background, in the case of Adi, what led to the matter was that a petition has been filed for the removal of the chief justice from office. So the president received the petition, he acted strictly according to the constitution and went ahead to form the committee to inquire into the removal of the chief judges from office because he was complying with the dictates of 146 law 6, which didn't make it a requirement that there must be a prima facie case. Then an action was brought in the Supreme Court by a arguing that it was wrong for the president to go ahead and then form the committee without establishing a prima facie case first. He mentioned that even though the constitution says that when you are going to remove the president, when you are going to remove the chief justice, under one for the six law six, there's no need for a prima facie case. According to IGH, there must be the, the provision that relates to all other superior court justices says that that one must also apply to the chief justice. So Ajayetun was arguing that if a petition is sent for the removal of any other justice of the superior court, maybe a high court judge, court of approval judge, there's a need to see out frivolous petitions by first establishing a prima facie case. How come the main obama for the chief justice, for the judicial, the chief justice, when there's a Petition for his removal, there's no need for prima facie case. He said that's a problem. But remember, what the president did was just in accordance with what the constitution says. Let us see how the Supreme Court will address this issue. And I'm quoting the judgment, the dictum of Dr. Ba JS in Adjetum versus Attorney General. And I quoted 2005-2006, Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report at page 732. This is what he says. In my view, the objective purpose and spirit of the 1992 constitution require that a chief justice be given the benefits of a power determination as to whether there is a prima facie case established against him or her before the president may establish a committee to consider a petition for his or her removal. A comparative examination of the relevant provisions dealing with petitions for the removal of under superior court justices in Article 1 for the six clause 3 and 4 reveals an omission in the plain language of Article 1 for the six clause 6 relating to the impeachment process of the Chief Justice, which, in my view, could not have been intended. By the framers of the constitution. The omission to provide for a proud determination of a prima facie case leads to a manifest absurdity which this court has the power to avert. 
in effect, one is saying that there's a logical gap or inadvertent mistake in Article 146 plus 6, which this court should correct by interpretation. The purpose of Article 146 plus 6 is to enable credible allegations as to the Chief Justice's stated misbehavior, incompetence, or infirmity of body or mind to be investigated. No reasonable interpreter could reach the conclusion that its purpose also includes providing a forum for the ventilation of frivolous or vexatious petitions. These observations regarding the purpose of Article 1 for the Six Law 6 are obviously to be taken into account in determining the meaning of the provision. Then it goes ahead, it goes ahead. And I'm continuing the quote. In my view, the purposive approach to interpretation of our constitution requires that in the context of this case, implicit words be read into the constitution to avert a manifest absurdity. It has to be remembered that there is room for the unwritten in the written constitution. I'll take that again. It has to be remembered that there is room for the unwritten in the written constitution. The fact that a country has a written constitution does not mean that only its letter may be interpreted. The courts have the responsibility for distilling the spirits of the constitution from its underlying philosophy, core values, basic structure, the history and nature of the country's legal and political systems, etc., in order to determine what implicit provisions in the written constitution flow inexorably from the spirit. The requirements of the establishment of a prima facie case against a chief justice before a committee is empaneled to consider a petition far for his removal is one such implicit provision. The authority of the courts to imply such a provision through purposive interpretation is not a license for the judges to rewrite the constitution. The interpretative authority is a limited one to make explicit what is implied within the penumbra of the letter of the constitution, given the constitution's objective purpose core values, and underlying philosophy. The living constitution, as famously referred to by Soa GSC, as he then was in Tufo and Attorney General. 1980 Ghana Law Report, page 637, at page 647, comprises both the letter and spirit of the constitution. From within the penumbra, of the letter of the constitution may be implied some provisions as are essential for effectuating the purpose and spirit of the constitution. Then he goes ahead as follows. With respect, what I'm seeking to do is not to import my intention into Article 1 for the six plus six, but to determine its meaning in the light of its context and purpose. To do that, I believe that it is necessary to read Article 146 as a whole and to make explicit what is implicit within the penumbra of the language employed in Article 146 or 6. I do not believe that the framers of our constitution would have intended a procedure which lends itself to manipulation and to interference with the independence of the judiciary. 
There is a parallel need for a process which ensures an independent determination of whether there is a prima facie case against the Chief Justice. I consider that the reasonable implication to be made from the context of Article 146 Law 6 is that the Council of States should play a prominent role in the determination of whether there is a prima facie case against the Chief Justice. Accordingly, I am inclined to grant the plaintiff a declaration that the consultation by the President with the Council of States in respect of the appointment of a committee to inquire into a petition for the removal of the Chief Justice shall first determine whether the said petition discloses a prima facie case before the committee is appointed. It will be prudent for the Council of States to evolve a convention by virtue of which the advice of a, rep a reputable independent lawyer is sought as part of the consultative process with the president and the court ends. This is the dictum of the Tiba GSC in the Jetun and Attorney General. And he's saying that there's room for the unwritten in the written constitution. This is a clear case of the law says this, that if the chief justice, there need not be a prima facie case. But the court noted that that would be a logical gap. That was an inadvertent mistake. That was an omission that the court had to fill by way of interpretation. You will see from this that when we talk about the constitution, we are not referring to just what is written in black and white because the court has a role to play in determining the spirits of the constitution. And so when people say that after the constitution is in English language, they can read and understand and say, what are the real ideas true? Because if you read according to the literal meaning, I did, you know, if the court would have held that because the law says that for city justice, there would no problem for cities, they can go ahead and look at the removal. But the court has read meaning and has breathed life into one for the six law six. So that now there's a need for a problem for cities before you move the chief justice. That was a very good judgment on that man. And then a very interesting case that you would like, the very famous 31st December case. This is the case of New Patriotic Party and Attorney General, 1993-1994, two Ghana law reports, P35. And in order to give a very good background before I read the opinions of the judges, may I just give a background about this particular case. So what led to this case was that there was a 1979 Republican constitution. The president at the time was President Hillary Man. But this constitution, this Republican constitution was overthrown in what has been described as a revolution on 31st December 1981 by the Provisional National Defensive Council, PNDC. So after that school in 1981, 31st December, the PNDC ruled from 81, 31st December, all the way to 93, until we had a new constitution, 7 January, 1993. Now, in between 31st December 1981 and 93, the PNDC government is taking steps to always celebrate 31st December as a national holiday. By then, it was a military regime. But when we returned to constitutional rule in 93, and they were taking steps to still celebrate 31st December as a national holiday, with state funds, the MPP brought an action to the Supreme Court seeking for a declaration that the intended celebration of the holiday 
was in conflict with the letter and spirit of the 1992 constitution. The MPP relied on Article 3 of the constitution, Article 35, and not Article 41. Article 3 of the constitution deals with the defense of the constitution. It shows that any person who tries to overthrow the constitution will commit an unlawful act. So the MP was arguing that if the constitution and Article 3 shows that if people commit school detours, it is an unlawful act, how would it be possible to use state funds to celebrate a coup d'etat? This case was keenly contested. There were nine judges. Five vote for majority, four vote for the minority. And that should let you know that it was keenly contested. Now, the attorney general argued that when it comes to celebrating holidays, it's a prerogative of the executive. So the court should not be interfering and poking their nose into matters of the executive. And that if the court pokes its nose into it, it will be an affront to separation of powers. So at least you have a background about what the case is about. Remember, there were five judges that wrote for the majority, and then four wrote for the minority. And so for the majority and the minority, you need to look at who that means you will be reading. You, I, you must read all of them in order to get a very good picture of what happened in the case. But I'll begin with the dissenting opinion of Archer J.S. captured at page 47 to 49 of the, of the report. And I'm quoting. The gist of the plaintiff's case is that the celebration of 31st December as a public holiday is inconsistent with or in contravention of the letter and spirit of the Constitution, 1992. The plaintiff relied on Article 3, Clause 3, Clause 4, Clause 5, Clause 6, Clause 7, and also Article 3, Clause 2, which reads, and I quote, any activity of a person or group of persons which suppresses or seeks to suppress the lawful political activity of any person or any class of persons or persons generally is unlawful. Quote ends. I must confess that I find it extremely difficult to agree that the mere declaration and celebration of a public holiday will suppress or seek to suppress the lawful political activity of any other persons or class of persons or persons in general. There's nothing in PNDC Law 220 which prohibits the holding of political rallies or meetings on public holidays, including 31 December 19, including the first December. Article 3, clause 3 of the Constitution, 1992, also provides, and I quote, any person who by himself or in concert with others by any violence or other unlawful means suspends or overthrows or abrogates this constitution or any part of it or attempts to do any such act or B, aids and abets in any manner any person referred to in paragraph A of this clause commits the offense of high treason and shall upon conviction be sentenced to suffer death, whose ends. When this Article 3.3 of the Constitution 1992 is applied to the environment of the plaintiff's statement of his case, it is possible to conclude that the celebration of the public holiday will amount to suspension overthrow or abrogation of the Constitution, 1992. The letter of the Constitution relied on by the plaintiff does not fit the vehemence 
in the environment are not caught by the letter. With this, con with this conclusion, I do not think it is necessary to refer to or deal with Article 3 plus 4, plus 5, plus 6, and plus 7 of the Constitution, 1992. The plaintiff has also relied on the spirit of the Constitution, 1992. I understand this reliance to be simply this. The 1992 Constitution has said goodbye to all coups d'etat and has introduced a constitutional democracy. Therefore, nothing should be done to remind the Indians of the past by paying premium to the events that occurred on 31st December, 1981. Wherein lies the spirit of the constitution? Is it embedded in the whole document or in parts of the document? When we interpret statutes, we do not rely on the spirit of the act. This maxim of interpretation applies also to a constitution. When the words are clear and unambiguous, we do not go further to imagine or speculate on what the words mean. What I know is that at times, it may become, it becomes necessary to find out the intention of the legislature. This is what is meant by intendment of the legislature. When one applies the intendment of the consultative assembly, it is clear that the constitution makers did not intend that the amendment in the plaintiff's statement of claim against the defendant could amount to a violation of or inconsistency with the constitution, 1992. Mere remembrance of an event in the political history of this country cannot amount to subversion of the Constitution, 1992. Human memory at times can be more accurate than the mechanism of a tape recorder, which can also be faulty at times. When one records something on the tape, the recording can be raised and the tape can be reused. The human memory is eternal and everlasting. One cannot obliterate historical events from the minds of men who witnessed the events. Can we prevent Ghanaians from reminiscing on the events of 31st December 1981? If they choose to, certainly not. I have found it unnecessary to dive and delve further into what is meant by the spirit of the constitution, because I am convinced that it is a cliche used in certain foreign countries when interpreting their own constitutions, which were drafted to suit their own circumstances and political thoughts. Whether the word spirit is a metaphysical or transcendental concept, I wish to refrain from relying on it, as it may lead me to conscience of frustration. I would rather rely on the letter and intendment of the Constitution, 1992. Again, I'll take that portion again. Whether the word spirit is a metaphysical or transcendental concept, I wish to refrain from relying on it, as it may lead me to a conscience of frustration. I would rather rely on the letter and intendment of the Constitution, 1992. Then he goes ahead, and I'm continuing. I'm still reading the dictum of Archer C.J. The same thing. And I'm quoting. Should the declarations sought be granted, I have already referred to the doctrine of separation of powers, 
which pervaded the constitutions 1969 and 1979, and which now permeates the constitution 1992. The present constitution 1992 guarantees the independence of the judiciary, which is subject only to the constitution. And this is reinforced by Article 125 Clause 3, which provides, and I'm quoting, the judicial power of Ghana shall be vested in the judiciary. Accordingly, neither the president, nor parliament, nor any organ or agency of the president or parliament shall have or be given final judicial power. Quote ends. The Constitution 1992 gives the judiciary power to interpret and enforce the Constitution, 1992. And I do not think that this independence enables the Supreme Court to do what it likes by undertaking incursions into territory reserved for Parliament and the Executive. This court should not behave like an octopus, stretching its ace tentacles here and there to grasp jurisdiction not constitutionally meant for it. I hold that this court has no constitutional power to prevent the executive from proclaiming 33 December as a public holiday because the executive then would be applying an existing law in PNDS Law 220, which can only be amended by parliament. Under section 30 of the transitional provisions of the Constitution 1992, the first president under the Constitution 1992 by a constitutional instrument may at any time within 12 months after assuming office as president make such provision as may appear necessary for repealing, modifying, adding to, or adapting any law for bringing it into accord with the provisions of the Constitution, 1992 or otherwise, for giving effect to the Constitution. At the time the writ was filed, the President had not repealed or modified the first schedule to the PNDC Law 220, which was existing and therefore the Executive could rely on it. Parliament which has the power to enact laws, has also not bothered to modify the fair shadow to PNC Law 220. If Ghanaians, including the plaintiff, feel very strongly about the fair December as a public holiday, the door is not closed to them. They should urge their representatives in parliament to amend the schedule by deleting any public holidays that are obnoxious and undesirable. It is not the power, it is not the function of this court to effect such amendments or repeals. It would amount to a naked usurpation of the constitutional powers of parliament. Now, what about the other relief sorts? An order directing the government of Ghana to cancel all preparations for the celebration of the overthrow of the legally constituted government of Ghana on 31 December 1981 aforesaid, and to refrain from carrying out such celebration financed from public funds. I have always held the view that this court, like equity, must not act in vain. In other words, it should not make others that could be lawfully and legitimately circumvented so as to make the court a laughing stock. Under the Constitution, 1992, the president is the commander in chief of the Ghana Armed Forces. Suppose he accepts the declaration, sorts, and confers with his commanders and service chiefs not to hold any route match. On 31st December 1993, yet the non commissioned officers who were instrumental in staging the 31st December 1981 coup chose to parade through the streets of Accra. Who can stop them? 
Is this court going to send judges, magistrates, registrars, court bailiffs, and ashes to erect barricades in the parts of the marches? Again, suppose notwithstanding the orders of this court, members of the governing party and their allies choose to celebrate 31 December with picnics, processions, and dances. Who can stop them? I must confess that the more I ponder over the relief sort, the more I become convinced of the futility of the others being sought. I think this is a case which requires realism, pragmatism, and foresight on the part of this court. The other ambit of the relief sort is from order directed to the government to refrain from carrying out any such celebration financed from public funds. The defendant admitted, and I quote, that money was legally appropriated under the 1993 budget, which were lawfully being used for the celebration of both the historical values that the 31st December Revolution stood for and the first anniversary of the Fourth Republic, which was born out of the values of the 33rd December Revolution. And it puts ends. I shall ignore this innocuous political rhetoric in this admission and attempt to answer the question whether the judiciary in this country has ever had the opportunity and power to prevent Parliament from appropriating money for use by the executive. Article 108 of the Constitution provides as follows. And I quote, Parliament shall not, unless the bill is introduced or the motion is introduced by or on behalf of the president, A, proceed on a bill, including an amendment to a bill, that in the opinion of the person presiding, makes provision for any of the following. I, the imposition of taxation or the alteration of taxation otherwise than by reduction, or II, the imposition of a charge on the consolidated fund or other public funds of Ghana, or the alteration of any such charge otherwise than by reduction, or III, the payment issue or withdrawal from the consolidated fund or other public funds of Ghana, or monies not charged on the consolidated fund, or any increase in the amount of that payment issue or redoal. IV, the composition or remission of any debts due to the government of Ghana, or B, proceed upon a motion, including an amendment to a motion, the effect of which, in the opinion of the person presiding, would be to make provision for any of the purposes specified in paragraph A of this article. I have quoted this article in extenso to demonstrate the procedure the Constitution 1992 has laid down for the provision of monies for the government to administer the country. It is only the president who is the head of the executive who can go to parliament to seek financial provision charged on the consolidated fund. Nowhere in this article is the role of the judiciary mentioned. Yet, this court is being invited to prevent the government from spending monies which parliament has constitutionally provided for government use. I think if the order is granted, it would amount to judicial officiousness poking our noses into the affairs of parliament and intermeddling with the prerogative of the executive by directing the government not to spend monies approved by parliament. Such a move clearly amounts to a violation of the doctrine of separation of powers, which is the core of our constitution. If this court interferes, then what is the necessity for the Office of the Auditor General 
under Article 187 of Chapter 13 of the Constitution, 1992. It has been maintained that the monies voted for the declaration for the celebration of the 31st December holiday amount to misapplication of public funds. It is not the duty of this court to don the mantle and cloak of the auditor general, whose duty under Article 187 Clause 2 of the Constitution is to audit all public accounts of Ghana. And within six months after the end of the immediately preceding financial year, to submit his report to Parliament, drawing attention to irregularities in the accounts audited and to any other matter which, in his opinion, ought to be brought to the notice of Parliament. My opinion is based purely on the doctrine of separation of powers as regards Parliament. The executive and the judiciary, which augurs well for this country. The defendant has averred that the plaintiff's case is an attempt to challenge the validity of the transitional provisions of the Constitution, 1992. For my part, I do not want to carry Paul to Newcastle because my views on the transitional provisions can be found in the case of Quache. Versus Attorney General, 1981, Ghana Report, and page 9, Supreme Court. I stand by every word I said in my judgment in that case. If one spirit of the Constitution, 1992, is to bid farewell to all coups, there is yet another spirit of the Constitution, 1992, through the transitional provisions, which in effect exhorts and admonishes all of us to forgive all those who staged previous schools. However, it does not say we should forget. That would be impossible. I hope I will not be mistakenly referred to as a supporter of coup. In this regard, I wish to refer to my judgment in Ato Mensa, Mr. The Republic, 1967 Ghana Law Report, page 562 and 586, where I cited the famous Spanish American philosopher, George Santayana, as quoted in Durant, Outlines of Philosophy, 1962 edition, at page 431. And I quote Revolutions are ambiguous things. Their success is generally proportionate to their power of adaptation and to the reabsorption within them of what they rebelled against. A thousand reforms have left the world as corrupt as ever. For each successful reform has founded a new institution, and this institution has bred its new and congenial abuses. The quote ends. This is what I said on 2nd October 1967, when the then National Liberation Council had consolidated its power and had erected the apogee of its evolution, of its revolution. It was the first coup in this country, and my words were to alert the council to the wise words of George Santayana. Before I end, I wish to refer to a submission made by Leonard Council for the plaintiff. He mentioned the penalties in the public holidays law. These penalties were introduced for the first time in this country by the then National Redemption Council, headed by Mr. Echampon. I say Mr. Echampon because, as we all know, he was deprived of his military rank of general by the Supreme Military Council under military law, which I must respect. As far as I know, no prosecutions have taken place, and I hope there will not be any. In a country where we have no age-old no age old pension schemes, no unemployed benefits, and no family benefits, 
I do not see why a person should not be permitted to work on public holidays to earn his living. It is monstrous to deprive him of the opportunity of earning some income to feed himself only because a law has ordained that he must observe a particular public holiday and he must rest, whether he needs rest or not. At this stage, I shall refrain from expressing any views as to whether or not these restrictions and penalties constitute violations of fundamental human rights. But is it morally right and just that a self-employed person should be prevented from working on a public holiday to earn his living? I leave this question to Parliament and the executive for them to answer. Finally, I wish to make an observation. Before this action was instituted, Ghana had 10 public holidays throughout the year and second only to Northern Ireland throughout the whole world, which has 11 public holidays. One of them is 12 July in commemoration of the Battle of Boyne in, 19, in 1690, when the forces of the Roman Catholic King James II were defeated by the Protestant forces of King William III, Prince of Orange. Up to this day, the Protestants in Ulster celebrate this public holiday with marches through the streets of Belfast without any obstruction or protestation from the, from the Catholic minority. What an admirable tolerance. Ghana has more holidays than England and Wales and Scotland, each with nine holidays. Can a developing country like Ghana afford a string of holidays which at times can be boring? I leave the answer to Parliament and the Executive. The British colonial administration introduced six public holidays in this country in 1899. We have 10, and I wonder what would be the number by the year 2000. In conclusion, I'm of the opinion that this court, in view of the doctrine of the concept of separation of powers embedded in our past and present constitutions, is not competent to grant the relief sought by the plaintiff. I have demonstrated that this court would be guilty of three inexcusable and unconstitutional trespasses. First, a trespass into the domain of parliament. Secondly, a trespass into the territory of the executive. And thirdly, a trespass into the terrain of the Auditor General. These trespasses should be avoided by not granting the declarations and the other sorts by the plaintiff. Quote ends. This is the dictum of Archer C.J. And remember, I said it's a dissenting opinion. And so what Archer is saying essentially is that the action by the plaintiff should be dismissed and that the government should be allowed to celebrate 35 December with the state's funds. That was a very interesting dictum. But as I stated, that was a dictum from the minority side. That's the dissenting opinion. So I'll read one dictum from the majority, and that will be the end of our discussion. But I believe you will notice that Archer was saying that he didn't know what you mean by spirit of the constitution. So he was confining himself to the letter. I had to bring that to let you know that there are some people who doubt the existence of the spirit of the constitution. In case you have forgotten, let me remind you of what he said about the spirit. I have found it unnecessary to delve, I have found unnecessary to die and delve further into what is meant by the spirit of the constitution. Because I'm convinced that it's a cliche used in certain foreign countries when interpreting their own constitutions, which were drafted to suit their own circumstances and political thoughts. 
whether the word spirit is a metaphysical or a transcendental concept, I wish to refrain from relying on it, as it may lead me to a conscient obfuscation. I would rather rely on the intendment of the Constitution 1992. Atta C.J. doubts the existence of the spirit of the Constitution. Now let's come to the majority. One victim I'm reading is from Francois G.S. And I'm quoting as follows from Francois. A constitutional document must be interpreted sui generis to allow the written word and the spirits that animate it to exist in perfect harmony. If it is interpreted according to principles suitable to its particular character and not necessarily according to the ordinary rules and presumptions of statutory interpretation, See Minister of Home Affairs versus Fisher. 1979, three All England reports, page 221 BC. This allows for a broad and liberal interpretation to achieve enlightened objectives, while it rejects height bound restrictions that stifle and subvert its true vision. In the celebrated case of Tufon and Attorney General, 1980 Ghana Law Report 637 at 647, the Court of Appeal sitting at the Supreme Court said as follows, and I quote A written constitution like ours is not an ordinary act of parliament, it embodies the will of the people. It is also mirrors their history. Account therefore needs to be taken of it as a landmark in a people's search for progress. It contains within it their aspirations and their hopes for a better and a fuller life. The constitution has its letter of the law. Equally, the constitution has its spirit. It is the fountain head for the authority which each of the three arms of government possesses and exercises. My own contribution to the evaluation of a constitution is that a constitution is the outpouring of the soul of the nation. And its precious life blood is its spirit. Accordingly, in interpreting the constitution, we fail in our duty if we ignore its spirit. I'll take that part again. My own contribution to the evaluation of a constitution is that a constitution is the outpouring of the soul of the nation. And this precious life blood is its spirit. Accordingly, in interpreting the constitution, we fail in our duty if we ignore its spirit. Both the letter and the spirit of the constitution are essential fulcra which provide the leverage in the task of interpretation. In support of this, we may profitably turn to the Constitution 1992 itself, which directs that we accord due recognition to the spirit that pervades its provisions. In Article 17 Clause 4, D of the Constitution. 1992. Parliament is enjoined not to enact laws inconsistent with the spirit of the Constitution. Pausing for a moment, it stands to reason that if Parliament ignores this caveat, the Supreme Court has the power to strike the legislation down. See Articles 1, Clause 2, and Article 2 of the Constitution. 1992. Again, in Article 21, Clause 4 of the Constitution, 1992, where restrictions are imposed in the interest of defense, public safety, or public order by court process, the Constitution, 1992, nevertheless requires that what is done under the authority of that law does not offend the spirit 
of this constitution. Another example of the all pervasive and embracing spirits to which there is a mandatory call to obeisance is Article 33, Clause 5 of the Constitution, 1992. All are enjoined to go beyond the written provisions, enshrining human rights, and to extend the concept to areas not specifically or directly mentioned, but which are inherent in the democracy and intended to secure the freedom and dignity of man. This is a poignant injunction to examine deeply any written provision so that its interpretation extends in depth to embrace its underlying spirit and philosophy. Constitutions differ. Some spell out in detail specific provisions to meet unusual circumstances. Some are frugal with a written word allowing for innovation. But in every case, a true cognition of the constitution can only proceed from the breath of understanding of its spirits. Sometimes the draftsman's felicity of language is seriously in question. But that's not the standing and despite the fact that the tailoring may betray a clumsy or unskilled hand. If the spirit is breathed into the written word, the objectives of the fundamental law can be achieved. The necessary conclusion is that the written word and its underlying spirits are inseparable bedfellows in the true interpretation of a constitution. If more persuasion were necessary, one would note what an American jurist, Justice Jackson, once said about the unwritten word in the written constitution. Justice Jackson said as follows, and I'm quoting, perhaps even more than by interpretation of its written word, this court has advanced the solidarity and prosperity of this nation by the meaning it has given to these great silences of the Constitution, quote ends. Indeed, it is the proper ascertainment of these silences that provide the measure of understanding of the basic constitutional concepts of the fundamental law. Finally, on this aspect of the spirit of the Constitution, one cannot omit reference to the wisdom of Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 8, which quotes that there is no man that had power over the spirit to imprison the spirit. Quote ends. Francois goes ahead to talk about the people's choice. And I'm quoting, still on the victim of Francois D.S. By a sovereign will, the people of this country have chosen a multi-party system of government to regulate their affairs. The fact that they chose a new direction and a new system of governance is the clearest pointer to change. In charting a different course, the democratic path, the people of this country took a solemn step away from what was immediately prevailing. Viewed in this light, it is ideal and illogical to hold that the old order has yielded place to, the, to nothing new. Especially when the new order is diametrically opposed to the old, which it supplanted. Looking then at the letter and spirit of the Constitution, 1992, we can hardly fail to conclude that the sum total of its provision demonstrates unequivocally an enshrinement from the old order and betrays a consanguinity rather with past constitutional regimes than with what it immediately displaced. 
This mutuation of steps to the accustomed and familiar path with a willingness and a determination to make a success of democracy this time around is being severely tested in this matter. The will of the people in the present context, if understood properly, is a solemn and incontrovertible declaration that however benevolent the resultant effects of the assault on constitutionalism, 31st December 1981 may be, it could not end the distinction of constitutional propriety. The Constitution 1992 is a severance from the immediate past, which it attempts to bury by prohibiting the exhumation of any aspect of it that could recall bitter memories, resentment, or revenge. The Constitution, with a charity of language that defies any attempt to obscure its purpose, condemns unreservedly any attempt to overthrow a duly constituted government by unlawful means, see Article 3 of the Constitution, 1992. Any such attempt would bear not only the stain and reproach of unconstitutionalism, but would purchase for its perpetrators the severest sanctions. Counsel for the State argues in paragraph 10 of the defense that the Constitution 1992 did not intend to look at unconstitutional acts with retrospective eyes. Regrettably, that argument misreads the Constitution and misses completely the force of its spirit. For if the Constitution 1992 frowns on violent overthrows of duly constituted government and rejects acts that put a premium on unconstitutionalism to the extent of even prescribing the promotion of a one-party state, it is naivety of the highest order to expect that the very constitution and in the same breath to sing hallelujah, hallelujah in the pain of praise to unconstitutional deviations, past or present. If the past is being duly buried, the spirit of the constitution 1992 would frown on the resurrection of any of its limbs. That is the whole point of the cloak of the indemnity conferred by Section 34 of the Transitional Provisions of the Constitution 1992, which will be addressed later. The quid pro quo is an expected reformation that would not flounce the past upon a forgiving people and subject them to a lifetime of trauma. In short, it is considered that the Constitution 1992 does not retroactively punish the actors in the coup d'etat. But at the same time, it places an embargo on future coups and on the priority of reasoning frowns on any reminders, especially of a celebration. Francois moves ahead to the celebration, and I'm still quoting. By definition, a celebration is a public observance which honors an event. It is accompanied by festivities and a general atmosphere of exhilaration. It extols and praises the event it commemorates. It is a public if it's a public celebration, then obviously the entire public except those in perpetual disgruntlement with life itself, who participate in the jolly making. Example, Independence Day. But where with the advent of 31st December 1981, a sizable section of the people recite a litany of ills and perpetually relive them. It cannot, with the best will in the world, be classified as an ideal scenario for a public celebration. 
nor can its baleful antecedents escape judicial notice. Logic and prudence would dictate the prohibition of such a public to do that would only promote division and fly in the face of constitutional injunction to let bygones be bygones. It is insensitiveness of, the, of a very high order which this court can countenance only with discomfort. Indeed, how can the objectiveness stated in Article 35 plus 4 and plus 5 of the Constitution be achieved in the heightened atmosphere of distrust and division? Article 35 plus 4 and 5 state as follows, and I quote, the state shall cultivate among all Ghanaians respect for fundamental human rights and freedoms and the dignity of the human person. The state shall actively promote the integration of the peoples of Ghana and prohibit discrimination and prejudice on the grounds of place of origin, circumstance of birth, ethnic origin, gender, or religion, creed, or other beliefs. Put ends. Put bluntly, there will always be a substantial section of the people of this country and not a petulant few who will never see joy in the 31st December celebration. It is for such as these that the state is to take appropriate measures to achieve the happy result of fostering a spirit of loyalty to Ghana that overrides every other loyalty and promotes among the people of Ghana the culture of political tolerance See Article 35, Clause 6, A, and Clause 9 of the Constitution, 1992. It was most unfortunate that Council should consider it proper to test a political gambit by inviting us to saunter along an avenue which our jurisdiction does not permit us to. I refer to the argument that urges us to consider the historical merits of the 31st December insurrection. To argue as council did that the 31st December is of historic importance because it's ushered in a millennium of peace and stability, attracting in its terrain an economic renaissance unparalleled in the history of this country, if I correctly capture his bits, is completely to misapprehend the limits of our jurisdiction of our judicial function, which I repeat is simply to juxtapose 31st Zimba events with the new order on the constitutional divide to pronounce it wanting or not wanting in the quality of its relationship with constitutionalism. Equally irrelevant for the same reasons were the references made in this court to other revolutions elsewhere, which attained a permanent status by being officially celebrated. In the attempt to persuade it to confer same distinction on 31st Zimba, it must be repeated that the changed democratic direction of pluralism that the Constitution 1992 ordains and the very limits with the Constitution 1992 listed on our judicial rule put effective fetters on our embarking on the discussion of the merits of 33 December. But one may, may comment that such arguments place a premium on coup d'etat. They seek an endorsement of revolutionary acts that topple governments before their time and demand a blessing to recipes and prescriptions to the violent overthrow of constitutional regimes. Article 3 plus 3 of the Constitution provides that, and I quote, any person who, A, by himself or in concert with others, by any violent or unlawful means, suspends or overthrows or abrogates this Constitution or any part of it, or attempt to do any such act, or B, 
eight and a bet in any manner, any person referred to in paragraph A of this clause commits the offense of high treason and shall upon conviction be sentenced to suffer death. The Deputy Attorney General urged to other matters that must be squarely answered. But first, it must be pointed out that any attempt to align this court's exercise of its interpretative jurisdiction to foraging in politics is as mischievous as it is unfortunate. In existence in our statute books is a law, PNDC Law 220, designating 31 December as a public holiday. The Deputy Attorney General, as an officer of the courts, has affirmed the money was voted by Parliament to celebrate the 31st December event. The simple issue that arises, as I have been at pains to point out, is whether in view of the new path the people of this country have chosen to tread, and which is at odds with violent revolutionary changes of government, such a public celebration is not a violation of the Constitution and consequently self-condemnation. The admission that a violent overthrow of a government occurred on 31st December forecloses any sanctioning of its public celebration in a constitutional era. Equally outside our purview were the arguments that the 31st December Revolution flowed into the Constitution, 1992, with its good works and values. Council's language, Epsima Bema. Here again, the dimensions of our duty of interpretation were mixed. For whether the event was an auspicious ray of sunshine, or alternatively, a dark cloud on the historical landscape is clearly outside our bounds. To link our duty with the subversive quest to undermine at section 34 2 of the transitional provisions of the Constitution, as was stated in paragraph 15 of the defense, is also unfortunate and mischievous. Perhaps we may again look with profit as to four and attending general. At page 655, 656, where the court state as follows that no person in authority can clothe himself with conduct which the constitution has not mandated. The question whether an act is repugnant to the constitution can only be, be determined by the Supreme Court. Before the insurrection of 31st December 1981, the people of this country, in the exercise of their natural, in, in the exercise of their inalienable rights as enshrined in their constitution, 1979, voted into office of their the government of their choice. It was the expression of their sovereign will. The insurrection of 31st December, however, overthrew this legally constituted government. It was not by due process, as provided in the Constitution, 1979, for the termination of the government, but by violent or lawful means. It has now been advocated that the celebration of this illegality is still permissible and should be in the constitutional era, and that this court should confer its constitutional blessing on the event. I see a patent incongruity, a contradiction in terms in this competition for respectability and legitimacy between the usurpers of power and the victuals of a successful putsch. Constitutional evolution and illegal revolution are poles apart, and like east is to west, never the twain shall meet. They certainly cannot jostle with each other in the Jokun Kamaridere. The issue must not be bled into a moral in contradistinction to a legal one. While this court cannot compromise its judgment by accepting arguments that emanate from the forum of conscience, beholding 
as we are only to the supremacy of the law. At the same time, we should decline to dismiss out of hand issues of mixed law and conscience, merely because they are interwoven. It must be truly recognized that there are many gray areas where constitutional imperatives cannot be divorced from the dictates of good conscience. This is not a mere intellectual engagement or as academicians will put it, a dialectical disputation. Some illustrations are called for. If the argument on the supremacy of the 31st December event is sound, it is curious there is no support for it in the constitution itself, where we rather see transparently beyond peradventure an attempt to distance constitutionalism from overthrows of duly constituted government. Again, if the achievement of the 31st December should maintain a pride place in the social fabric as a, it is strange that that event was not expected or not, was not accepted from the general antipathy expressed in the constitution towards the heresy of revolutions with the accompanying penalty of the fulfillment of life itself. The under window offers a corresponding view. Ancient mythology and Christian theology both recognize a dose as machina, a dreadful engine of vengeance that comes as a thunderbolt to impose draconian solutions on mortal mistakes. In the Christian world, it is a chastening or corrective machinery to enforce the renunciation of evil ways to obtain salvation. But no one in his proper senses would place such an event on a pedestal for worship and veneration. That would accord ill with the Lord's own sense of justice. For it is not a day marked with rejoicing and festivities, rather, it conjures the scenario of sackcloth and ashes. So, the 31st December receives the rebuff of conscience in its efforts at acclamation. The legal determination achieves the same results. For the shroud of indemnity, in section 34 of the transitional provisions of the Constitution, completely mummifies the 31st December event and reduces it to an impotent, unmentionable event at law. It must remain so in this sarcophagus. That said, it is not our province to indulge in a debate on extrinsic merits, for we do not espouse a cause or denounce one. The historic perspective allowed us is only to place 31 December on the calendar as a happening. We accordingly leave it to history and posterity as better judges to pronounce on the quality of that event and give it its rightful place. For it is history that accords its epic moments, the distinction of an indestructible accolade. One can hardly resist here a pertinent aside. The proper evaluation of any historical event requires a measured period of time for analysis, untrammeled by emotive or other considerations. Those breathing the current air are enveloped in this environment, are disabled by their proximity to the event in time and place for making sound, objective, and valid judgments. Fortunately, and I repeat, it is not the province of this court to embark on an evaluative excursus. Ours is to relate that day, 31 December, with all its trappings to the new political order ushered in by the Constitution, 1992, and to declare whether the two should conformably exist. And if not, whether reminders of that event in public declarations and celebrations and at public expense could be permitted in our changed democratic circumstances. A democratic commitment demands an unremitting effort at ascertaining the underlying spirit of the Constitution, 1992, and obeying it. 
Thus, may we turn with profit to Article 56 of the Constitution. This article embodies the spirit which compels the rejection of the servitude, which arbitrariness imposes, and which a slave mentality willingly accepts. Article 56 of the Constitution states, Parliament shall have no power to enact a law to establish or otherwise the establishment of a body or movement with the right or power to impose on the people of Ghana a common program or a set of objectives of a religious or political nature. The quote ends. Enshrining the 23rd December event as a public holiday breaches Article 56 of the Constitution. Parliament cannot authorize expenditure from state coffers for the commemoration, celebration, of all illegal events which many citizens may not approve. Inherent in Article 56 of the Constitution is the impropriety to impose and ram down people's truths on popular programs with set political objectives. Implicit also in this article is the invitation to all constitutionally minded citizens of Ghana to fight the imposition or inflation of private programs on the public and to resist the coercive enforcement through the machinery of the law. And then the Lena Justice proceeds to discuss the indemnity. An indemnity suggests exemption from penalties. It is the closing of a chapter, the commencement of a fresh start with the opening of a new page. Recriminations enmity and rancor which may be carried over from the past are prescribed in constitutional terms and with the relevance of our own circumstances. An indemnity connotes a perception of a bright future and all past errors consigned to the archives of history. There is a tacit implication that it may not augur well for the country if it were to be perpetually embroiled with the rights and wrongs of the past in the vengeful pursuit of the pound of flesh. With that certain, it is clearly unjust to exacerbate old wounds by permitting echoes of the past to reverberate and shatter the tranquility of the constitution 1992 sought to promote with its reconciliatory arrangements. An event that has earned its architects an indemnity under Section 34 of the Transitional Provisions of the Constitution must, as observed before, be consigned to the grave with the solemn quietus intoned by the said section. The Constitution 1992 reminds us that there that three such events in the past are to be buried with the indemnity of a pardon. Their ghosts should not linger around like phantom rats dispensing mischief with reckless abandon. A crude analogy is tying up the hands of a boxer to allow an adversary to pummel him into submission, pronounce his defeat, and allow the slaughter to continue. I proceed to now read the concluding paragraph of the victim of Francois D.S. Conclusion, and I'm quoting, I permit myself the indulgence to make some observations in conclusion. Even as it is axiomatic that one cannot boast of being a true Christian, if one is not acquainted with the good book, so does ignorance of the Constitution, 1992, project an unwillingness and an inability to defend it. How can the duty which every citizen is required to discharge in defending the Constitution under Article 3, Clause 4 and 41 be, be accomplished if its provisions are unknown and the citizens remain ignoramuses of the fundamental law? The narrow division this case has caused 
is the clearest manifestation of judicial independence. That quality of freedom the Constitution 1992 itself seeks to promote. This freedom is a necessary adjunct to the successful defense of the new social order and sustains the springboard for progress in our human development. The opposing views we respect are not caustic reflections on contrary views. They are honest individual perceptions of controversial matters. As W. O. Douglas put it in his article, The Dissent, A Safeguard of Democracy, and I quote, Disagreement among judges is as true to the character of democracy as freedom of speech itself. The truth is that the law is the highest form of compromise between competing interests. It is the product of attempted reconciliation between the many diverse groups in the society. When judges do not agree, it is a sign that they are dealing with problems on which society itself is divided. It is a democratic way to express this dissident views. Judges are to be honored rather than criticized for following that tradition, for proclaiming their articles of faith so that all may read. The quote ends. Then Francois Gersi continues. If our constitution, 1992, is to play an effective part in forging a viral democracy, it would be unacceptable to dilute it forth with the demolition of the structure of checks and balances that sustains it or negates its provisions on the altar of peace and stability. The court's independence and integrity are themselves powerful instruments for peace and tranquility. It was the late Chief Justice, Snora of the Israeli Supreme Court, who said that in any competing trust between truth and stability, truth must prevail. I conclude with two quotations which sum up this whole exercise of interpretation. The first is from Tufo and Attorney General at page 664, and I'm quoting. The ideals which the framers of the constitution were paint by the letter and spirit of this constitution to establish ought to be respected and adhered to. We are justice and fair play abhorrence of arbitrariness and discrimination, victimization and vindictiveness, the protection of the individual and his fundamental human rights within the walls of the constitution. We believe it was in pursuance of these ideals that the framers of the constitution formulated their proposals, the quote in. To Lord Tennyson, is reserved the last word. His counsel in one of his poems is to and I quote, take occasion by the hand and make the bounds of freedom wider yet, broad based upon a people's will. Quote ends. This is the end of the doublings dust, and dictum of Francois Gs. So this brings us to the end of the lecture on the nature, scope, and sources of constitutional law. I believe that by now, you'll be more interested to get the full cases that we have discussed, namely to foreign attorney general, Marby and Madison, Adietu and attorney general, and then a new patriotic party versus attorney general, the third is in my case. Thank you.